Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our EFCA 11 a.m. service. We are live streaming today here from the church hall. Unfortunately, it's just myself, Pastor John, uh, and Ming here on AB. But we're very glad to have all of you joining us uh, online from your homes. Uh, we hope you find today's service uh, edifying uh, and encouraging. It indeed has been uh, a big week uh, for all of us and the whole of Sydney. We are entering our second week of lockdown. I'm uh, wondering how you're feeling. Uh, I suspect, uh, like myself, you probably have a range of emotions, uh, frustration, uh, with all the uncertainty as to when this lockdown will actually end, uh, perhaps a bit of fear uh, with the growing number of cases and whether or not ourselves and those around us will contract the virus, and maybe disappointment as well uh, as we deal with uh, cancelled plans, um, rearrangements that have had to happen at short notice. It is indeed a difficult time for all of us, um, but we trust in the God who is in, in control. Uh, we know that we can commit all these things to Him, knowing that He is a God who cares deeply about us. And let us continue to trust in Him wholeheartedly. And it's great that we can continue to meet together online, and even though we're not all physically together, we are very much so in spirit. We'll be starting a new series today on 1 Corinthians chapter 8 to 16, entitled Love and Maturity in Christ, a nine-week series spanning July and August. Here, the Apostle Paul addresses various questions and issues in the Corinthian church, and the result of God's word through him is to deepen us in love and maturity in Christ above worldliness, selfishness, and immaturity. I'm very excited for the upcoming series. Uh, there is much for us to learn both individually and as a church so that we can grow together in these series. Let us now commit this time that we have to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that in our time this morning we can set aside distractions so that we can concentrate on listening to your word and singing your praises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, the music team will now lead us in singing. Now, the ban on singing actually only applies to non-residential premises. Therefore, this does not apply if you are watching from home. So if you are comfortable and at home, please feel free to sing along. I believe in you. I believe. 
Thank you, music team. Uh, we'll now have a time of announcements. Uh, firstly, uh, Pastor John will go on well-deserved annual leave beginning tomorrow, uh, Monday the 5th to Saturday 10th of July, and we'll be back at church next Sunday on the 11th as normal. So during this time, if there are any pastoral issues, please either contact um, Senior Pastor uh, Reverend C or a Pastor Hum. Uh, growth groups will continue to meet uh, online, uh, so please get in touch with your growth group leaders uh, for more information. Uh, we will still have Q&A today, so please do uh, put in your questions on Slido. Uh, our Slido code today is 070421. And as announced last week by Pastor John, Paolo Santaland will be our student pastor at EFCA beginning today. Uh, it is exciting news and to find out a little bit more about Paolo and his new role, we will now have an interview with Paolo and Sharice. Hi church, it's Therese, I am back and it is going to be another interview. I um, hope you're all doing well um, a week into this lockdown, hopefully only for two weeks. And I do have a special guest joining us today that Pastor John semi foreshadowed last week. Um, so if our special guests would like to introduce themselves and say hi. Whoa, <laughs> hello. Hey Paolo. How hey are you? Therese. Thanks for joining us today for the interview segment. Oh, good. Um, would you like to start off by just introducing yourself and your family? Uh, yep. So my name is Paolo. Um, I've got a mom and a dad in, at home and my sister, who's in year 12, is going to do HSC very soon. Very soon. Very exciting. Um, thanks for letting us know a bit about yourself. Um, oh, so how are you feeling, I guess, a weekend or like towards the start of this lockdown? Um, how are you feeling what are, what are you excited about or what has been not so good so far? Um, yeah, I'm excited about sleeping in. You don't have to wake up so early. That's such a great thing about lockdown. But the other thing is that I really wanted to see a lot of people. So it is what it is. But we'll get through this together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so pre-lockdown, I guess, and pre-COVID even. Um, tell us what tell us a little bit about what you've been doing in the past few years since graduating yep. uni and maybe also after that one or two big lessons that God has taught you. Yep. So after uni, I did a um I did a ministry apprenticeship up in the EU. Christian grew up in University of Sydney. That was really cool. And I think I've learned a lot in that space. But then after that, before COVID hit, 
I was planning to do teaching for a bit and then go into full-time ministry. Uh, but then COVID did hit. So I did a bunch of um, random stuff during that time. So I, I became a scripture teacher. Um, I was a casual teacher. And during the lockdown, lockdown, I was a lollipop man for a bit. So I got to save up some money so that I can go to Bible college and do that. And I think out of all those years, things that I've learned is that, um, I think the big one is that knowledge, even biblical knowledge, is not enough. It's just, if it stays all up here, it's, it's just not enough. It doesn't change your life and what you desire and what you want. That, that knowledge is, it's not true knowledge, as some biblical scholars might say. So I think that's the big thing that I've learned. And I've seen that in my life, even though I know certain things about God and his promises. But if it doesn't change me, I don't think I've really known it. And if I don't desire it, so those are the things that I've learned. And just other stuff as well that life is so uncertain, as with COVID has taught us. I think standing on the promises of God has been a really, really big lesson on that as well. Yeah. Yeah. And people are so important as well. When we're cut off from people, you just see you just see how important they are. So, yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> It does tie in with a lot of I think, what we're going to be looking at, even in 1 Corinthians in this next series um, of, you know, love trumping any knowledge. So thanks for sharing yeah. that. Um, so we've heard a bit about what you've been doing, you know, the last kind of 24 months or so. Um, what are your plans for the second half of this year and mm. beyond? Um, Bible college starting in July, mid-July-ish, yeah. and then the student minister thing. And then after that, hopefully in the future, I can get to do full-time ministry in Western Sydney, the mm-hmm. hood. Um, maybe just backtracking a little, do you want to explain a little bit of the student minister thing for those who might not have heard it? Yes. Um, so thankfully, EFC has took me on as a student minister, and that means I'll be doing um, Bible studies, um, working with Switch, um, leading service, and um, preaching a little bit here and there. And maybe meeting up one-to-one with certain people. Um, And that's all under um, Pastor John and getting trained up with him and learning from all these other people as well and how to do that in a church context. Because I I did it in a uni context, which is very different. And now doing it in a church context and learning from Pastor John and all these other people and how to serve in a church context. I think it's going to be exciting, but it's also not going to be easy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Um, Something that... You didn't mention earlier when you were talking about what you've done yes. in the last 24 months. Obviously, Paolo has also preached, guest preached for us from time to time. And some of you might have, you know, obviously seen him um, up the front. So it's really exciting that you're going to be uh, doing that a little bit more over yep. the next period mm. with us. Um, and I guess you already touched on it, but could you maybe share what else you're excited about or maybe nervous about in terms of either being at Moore College or being <laughs> here at the FCA? I think the big thing I'm excited about is that I'm going to be serving the people that I love. I think that's like the best job for me. That's like the best job. Like you get to talk about Jesus and you get to talk about them with the people that you really love. So um, that's just something really great. Um, I'm nervous about um, how complex it might get because you have to juggle so many things and then also studying about Bible college. Hopefully I don't crack under the pressure. Um, So please pray for me. Um, so yeah sure that actually leads to my last question which was yeah. how can we be praying for you aside from not cracking under the pressure oh yeah so besides that i think pray that i can also take care of myself well because if i don't take care of myself well that will just feed into how i do bible college and how i do ministry and i'm still figuring that out how to take care of myself well and pray for myself as well in terms of um i guess how i relate to different Um, age groups because I don't often relate to maybe people that are not my age let's say a bit older than me Um, so pray that I can do that really respectfully and really well as well Mm -hmm. two really important things um well on that note um why don't I say a quick prayer um for Paolo thanks for all your sharing with us um if Mm -hmm. you'd all like to join with me in prayer uh dear lord thank you for this time where we could um hear a bit more from Paolo about what he's been up to Um, last few years and also um, his exciting plans for um, the next few years. Thank you so much that he will be um, studying at Moore College and also um, embarking on this new journey as our student pastor. 
um, and just for all the things you've taught him that he will get to apply and all the things that he will get to learn as well um, in the next few months and years ahead. We particularly um, commit these two things in prayer that um, he's mentioned that you might help him as he does balance um, this load of part-time study plus part-time um, being a student pastor that, um, yeah, you'll help him amidst the pressure of trying to remember Greek and Hebrew and um, amidst, you know, getting to learn um, what ministry day-to-day -day really looks like um, at our church. Thank you so much for Pastor John taking him on and um, all the teaching that is going to be happening and mentoring. Um, we also just um, also really lift up in prayer power to you um, in terms of taking care of himself um, physically, mentally, emotionally, um, spiritually. Um, as he mentioned that all the stuff that he learns wouldn't just be knowledge, but would really translate into love and into action. And you'd help him amidst all these new opportunities and exciting things happening to uh, first and foremost, walk closely with you um, and strengthen his own relationship with you. Um, and yeah, take good care of himself so that he can run this race um, to the very end, um, not burn out and um, just be, yeah, living healthily um, in healthy patterns. Um, yeah, with you watching over him. Uh, we're really excited for what the future holds and thankful for you bringing him to this point um, and also at this church. And we bring all these things to you in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Great. Thanks, Paolo, for joining us for the church service. Um, we'll talk to you later. See ya. See ya. Thank you to Sharice and Paolo. Let us now continue praying. For the missionary family, the, the Kalos, who we support, who are serving in Thailand, as well as our sister Christy. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are God who knows our innermost thoughts and desires. You are not a God who is distant, but a God who cares deeply about us. Lord, we entrust our lives to you, especially in this time of uncertainty. We lay before our anxieties and fears before you. We lay them all down at the foot of the cross. Lord, we pray for the COVID-19 outbreak in Sydney. We pray that you would slow the number of infections across our city. We pray for those who are unwell and in isolation, that you would comfort them and watch over their physical and mental health. We thank you for our government and the health officials who work day and night to keep us safe. And we pray for them we pray that you'll grant them wisdom as they make weighty and difficult decisions in the coming weeks and months. Lord, we pray that the lockdown will end soon, but at the same time, that you would keep our city safe. Lord, we pray for Paolo. We thank you for his appointment as ESCA student pastor for 2021 and 2022. We pray that you would enable him to continue to be servant-hearted and equipped as he preaches and serves in various ministries. We pray that his ministry will be Christ-centered and we pray that we as a congregation may be able to support him in his new role. We pray that he'll be able to take care of himself and we pray that he will also be able to relate to others who aren't necessarily in his age group. And life stage. We pray for the Kalos who are serving in Thailand. We thank you for Belinda that she was able to hold a successful pre-home assignment workshop. We thank you that Jeff was able to have a fruitful discussion uh, regarding the five-year strategic plan for outreach in that region. And as COVID continues to spread, in Thailand. We pray for the safety uh, for the people there and we pray that the Thai Christians will be able to find creative ways uh, to meet and encourage each other. 
We pray that you'll keep the Callows safe during this time and help them to continue to serve. Uh, serve the ties faithfully. And lastly, we pray for Christy and the family. We pray in light of the cases of COVID in the area, that there will be no further complications in regards to her health, and that she would not have to be readmitted to hospital. Lord, for the times when that she does have to go into hospital for treatment and appointments, uh, we pray that she would continue to keep her and her family safe. And we pray uh, that we as a church, that we may continue uh, to keep her in our prayers and support them. And we bring before you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. John o will now uh, read the Bible for us. Uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. This morning's Bible reading comes from 1 Corinthians 8, the whole chapter. So we're looking at 1 Corinthians 8, 1 to 13. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother, for whom Christ died, is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and ruin their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause him to fall. Good morning, church. It's Pastor John here. Well, it's actually good to be uh, physically back here at church for me in terms of our uh, preaching compared to remote Zoom. And uh, step by step, we're hoping that uh, we'll see people come back. Uh, I guess the uh, COVID cases, uh, God willing, allowing for that. So the, uh, then the music team, as well as people back here as normal, so that we're getting back to what we're accustomed to because uh, face to face, of course, is uh, what we love and what we need. Uh, but we're thankful also for the technology that allows uh, this to happen so that we can connect online even if we're not physically here together. Well, as John had just read for us, uh, if you would like to keep 1 Corinthians 8 open as we're going to be looking at that in detail and the start of our new series, which uh, we trust will be actually great for us, stimulating, challenging and encouraging. The saying goes, it's not only what you know, but who you know. That is, above your own skills and qualifications is the necessary relationships with people and connections to get ahead, to open doors, to get a job, to get an interview, get your foot in the door, get things done. An emphasis not only in building up technical skills and knowledge, as important as they are, 
but the emphasis on networking, building relationships that will help for collaboration, for partnerships, for doing deals, new opportunities, all of those things. Well, as we begin our new series on 1 Corinthians 8 to 16 and chapter 8 today, the Apostle Paul believes in not only what you know, but who you know. And the most important one being Almighty God. And even more important than our active attempts to know him by our own initiative, by our own reaching out, it is God's initiative that matters, that we are known by him. He seeks us out to know us. And God's desire shapes our knowledge itself so that it's not only what you know, but how you will use that knowledge. So love must guide our knowledge naturally today using knowledge with love. So as we're starting our new sermon series in 1 Corinthians 8 to 16, the second half of the book, after doing the first half, uh, chapters 1 to 7 last year, as you might remember, we'll just revise some basic information. So firstly, background to 1 Corinthians. Well, Paul was called to be an apostle, as we can see in chapter 1, verse 1. One of the special messengers and eyewitnesses of the Lord Jesus, by the will of God. It was not Paul's own decision, because as we remember Paul's own story, the book of Acts chapter 9, Saul, who became Paul, was, risen, was met by the risen Jesus. Saul was transformed from being an enemy of God to then a servant of Christ. Paul has authority from God to speak his words for the Corinthians and for us as Christians today. We must listen as God speaks to us through Paul. Here on the map there, we can see that Corinth was located on the isthmus between Achaia and the Greek mainland. It was a prosperous city with big influxes of people from east and west. Looking at the book of Acts and other historical details help us flesh out the relationship between Paul and the Corinthians. Acts 18 tells us of his arrival in Corinth, where he stayed for 18 months in 50 to 51 AD. And not long after he arrived, he announced that he would preach the gospel to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, especially as so many Jews who he first spoke to wouldn't listen to him. So the Corinthian church had a lot of Gentile converts to Christianity. Paul has to deal with many issues arising from their worldly Gentile background. And so 1 Corinthians was likely written in the spring of 54 AD, meaning that the church consisted of new converts who had come to Christ with the previous three or four years as Christians at most. And Paul has to deal with the worldliness of the Corinthian church. And the culture of the city had flowed into the church. Issues like self-promotion, self-sufficiency, competition, rivalry and emphasis on freedom and rights that unfortunately can forget about love and respect for others. And here a central issue that Paul addresses in chapters 8 to 10 is whether Christians should eat food sacrificed to idols. In Corinth, the meat market and restaurants in the temples usually had their meat offered in sacrifice to the gods before being sold or cooked for meals. Hence, what to do if unbelievers invited the Christians to join them for a meal in their home or temple restaurant or eat food that has been sacrificed to idols? How do we we make sense of these invitations? Very kind for my unbelieving friend, but will that put me in a dilemma? And if we look over to chapter 10, verses 25 to 27, which we will look at in detail in a few weeks, then we see some of the details uh, that give us this background. And there are two groups in the Corinthian church that Paul addresses. Number one, the strong Christians saw no problem with eating anything, including food sacrificed to idols, because of what they saw as knowledge of the true God. But number two, the weak Christians would not eat food sacrificed to idols because of a more tender conscience such as not wanting to have any association with idols or pagan worship, especially if they have come out of that background to now come to become Christian. And we see this particularly in verse 7 of chapter 8 that's been read for us. And here in chapter 8, verses 9 to 12, when Paul talks about making someone stumble, 
It's not merely to offend them or upset them. No, it is more than that. It is the problem of acting in a way that causes someone to go against their conscience. So as we begin our chapter, Paul sets the groundwork for the Corinthians and us to have right perspective on what is really important. So secondly, the right knowledge. Let's look now at verses 1 to 3, chapter 8. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. Now here, Paul is not against knowledge itself per se, because as he will explain shortly, the right knowledge does give you confidence about what is right and wrong. So only with the right knowledge can you go forward with the right action. No, what Paul is speaking about here is the sort of knowledge which says, I know it all. Knowledge that has the attitude of arrogance and presumption. And underlying this wrong sort of knowledge is selfishness and immaturity. This wrong sort of knowledge gives some people a boost, but this is not real growth. It puffs up like pumping air into bicycle tyres or car tyres. Uh, it helps a bit, it gives a little bit more uh, shape, but it's not permanent or lasting, is it? Over time, the air will go out. It's not real growth, but only temporary. But instead, true Christian knowledge will be inseparably bound up with love. Love gives us the right focus of God and other people. From selfishness to God-centeredness and other person-centeredness, love builds up. It's like building a house, a full brick house with solid bricks. It is strong and lasting. It won't just shrink or then come smaller. It's more than just pumping up tires with air. It is solid growth. Love builds up. And the greatest knowledge of all is to know God. And this does not come about because of our great intellect or learned studies or our vigorous efforts to know him. No, it is God's own initiative to know us. He reached out to us in Christ Jesus. He opened our eyes with his truth and gave us the Holy Spirit so that we might belong to him. So true knowledge is a gift granted by God to us. So that we might know him. It is not a wage or a salary that we deserve after working hard. And the love that God works in us is to respond to his own love for us in Christ. His love is a mark, a sign of someone who is known by God. Love is the real mark that you belong to God. Not just facts or intellect. And that defines our response, doesn't it? If you are a recipient of a gift, the right response is humility and thanksgiving. It's surprise. I wasn't expecting it. I didn't deserve it, but I feel honoured. I'm delighted. Thank you. Rather than receiving our wages or salary, which is a much different attitude, isn't it? It's expected. And we say, about time. I was waiting for that. I'm getting what I deserve, what I've been working hard for. It's a different attitude between salary and also gift, isn't it? And the right knowledge of God will give great confidence because of who God is and what he has done for us. Let's look now at verses 4 to 6. So then about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords... Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. All things, including our own Christian existence, take our origin from God as a gift. And since the one true God is the goal of our existence, the means by which this comes about is the one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things come. And so he is the means of our existence. And here, as Paul lays out some statement of belief, there is a beautiful continuity between the Jewish faith of Israel and now the Christian gospel. 
for the proud Jewish Apostle Paul, along with all the other Jewish Apostles from their Jewish master Jesus, did not see themselves as starting a new religion. But what has come about through the arrival of Jesus Christ into our world is a revelation, a turning of the page to, so, to show something not seen before. That the same God, the one true God, who spoke our world into being, the Creator, and who sustains our world in His good pleasure, is now pleased to be known and shown in a revolutionary new way, through the intimate and personal contact through His Son, Jesus Christ. The fulfilment of what God had spoken to Israel through the prophets, through kings such as King David, is now come true through Christ Jesus. Now is for all the world. God, who had chosen Israel as his people, now pleased to open up his arms wide to the whole world. And this was his plan. And so Christ's likeness and the shape of the cross, which is how this has all happened, are now to mark all that Christians are and all that Christians do. Now here in verses 4 to 6, there's an acknowledgement that forces of evil are still present and involved behind idol worship. Paul will spell that out little, uh, in a little while. Whilst an idol is a, a useless bit of wood or stone, that uh, evil forces actually uh, use that as a vehicle, as he'll explain later. And the weak Christians know this all too well. But even then, even if there is danger and problems there, that does not overcome the greater point that for Christians, all things, even food, have their origin from God. He is still the creator of all good things. Nothing that evil things can do to contaminate or spoil can ruin God's sovereign power as the ruler and the redeemer. There is no need for fear as if Christians need to live in their own spiritual ghetto or commune away from everyone else. And they need to grow their own food so that they will not be contaminated by anything else. No, not at all. That is minuscule compared to the overarching power of God. They can be God's people, even a minority, amongst a larger unbelieving city. No threat, for God has all things in hand. Food makes no difference to the power and the sovereignty of God. Well, even as Paul identifies the knowledge they should all have, the strong position that he has, he's definitely with the strong. He's deeply caring and empathic for those who struggle. The weak brothers and sisters, he understands them. He doesn't judge them or look down on them. He walks in their shoes, even if that's not him. If he's unmistakably a strong Christian, yet he's got all the time in the world for those who can't hold the same position. So thirdly, knowledge with love. Let's look now at verses 7 and 8. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a God. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Now here we need to discuss the idea of conscience. Another word for conscience is self-awareness. It's part of our inner life, our thoughts, our ability to reflect, processing emotions and events, and also our sense of right and wrong. So then, if we apply this to the strong and the weak Christians, the strong have a good sense of conscience, of self-awareness. That is, they know that the one true God rules. Idols are not real, as Paul has just explained. No problem for them. But for the weak, they have an insecure self-awareness because they have come out of idol worship. They're not quite resilient enough to now eat food that is sacrificed to idols because that will cause them problems. It will cause them flashbacks, taking them back to the bad old days that they want to leave behind. That old force of habit comes back. And they experience the act of eating food sacrificed to idols as if it was an actual idol sacrifice. And for them, 
That is the same as betrayal. An act of denying their new identity in Christ, whereas they renounced all of those old idol practices to now follow Jesus instead. So that is what is behind this. That is why that is a problem for the weak. Years ago, when I was a uni student, I went on short-term mission to China twice. At the end of our first trip, we went on sightseeing, including uh, lots of historical places and some ancient temples. One of the women in our team had become a Christian out of ancestor worship. And when we had come to a temple, she would choose to stand outside and not join the rest of us sightseeing inside the temples. Because for her, it would remind her of the, in a bad way, of what she used to do. That was her. And it saddened her, reminding her that most of her family who had not turned to Christ yet, but were still idol worshipping, unlike her. Now, at first, when she was standing outside, it was strange. But when she explained this, it made sense. At first, I thought, why can't you join the rest of us? Come on, just come in. But then the Christian way of knowledge and love meant understanding her, respecting her, being considerate, being considerate of her needs and these choices. Well, in our day and age, it's a little bit like different approaches to uh, the area of drinking alcohol. Uh, so for many of us as Christians, uh, we could have a glass of beer or wine, go to a party or a wedding and have champagne at the toast, or have one or two drinks and not feel like we have to drink until getting drunk or passing out. And that's all well and good. But in our churches, we have Christians who are reformed alcoholics. Uh, men and women who used to drink regularly to excess with all the problems that that caused. And by the grace of God, they became sober. Uh, there was Alcoholics Anonymous uh, or other good means. Now for, for them, sobriety means never drinking alcohol again because that will take them back to the bad old days. That will result in drinking to excess. So in their conscience, their self-awareness, they know that they cannot drink at all now. And uh, one of these was uh, a lovely older Christian man from one of my old churches. A lovely man, very encouraging. He's a, he was a reformed alcoholic. Uh, now he doesn't drink any alcohol to not threaten his sobriety. He's comfortable with other people having a drink around him. So if we went out for a, uh, a Bible study dinner, a fellowship dinner, everyone else could be having wine. Um, he's okay with that. He'll just have something non-alcoholic. So when we understand things like this, those of us who can have some alcohol cannot look down on those who cannot have alcohol or choose not to drink. It's not like we can be somehow judgmental or superior and say, oh, why can't you just have a little bit in moderation? No, because it will take them back to the bad old days. We respect their reasons. We understand them. We're considerate towards them. Even if we see ourselves as strong because I can have some, uh, it doesn't have to cause me a problem. Well, in that case, even if you call them weak, then understanding it doesn't matter. It's not superiority, inferiority. It's conscience, it's self-awareness, and that's respect. So knowledge and freedom must not be used just for ourselves, but with love towards brothers and sisters. Let's come back now to 1 Corinthians. Let's look at verses 9 to 11. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. What's at stake here is more than just the weaker ones sinning against their conscience. That is, doing something they're not comfortable with, uh, which is a problem itself. But more than that, the bigger problem is it is a Christian lapse, which compromises their very Christian identity. As we've said before, if the weaker brethren have come out of an idol-worshipping background, where eating food sacrificed to idols was a key part of their idol worship, which they have now renounced 
in becoming Christians. Then if they are still weak, tender or sensitive on this issue, then for them to be influenced to again eat food sacrificed to idols will cause them to relapse. They'll have this experience, this flashback of being an unbeliever all over again. It will expose them to a problem that will cause them a real problem with allegiance to the idols, not Christ. And as each person matters, not because of how rich they are or the skills they bring to the church, for above all human estimations of value comes the priceless value that each one of us are precious to God. Each one of us are for whom Christ died to save and rescue. Then they matter. It is not a light thing to think about the well-being of a brother or sister. So when people's spiritual lives and well-being is at stake, this is a serious matter. Let's look now at verses 12 and 13. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. It is our identity in belonging to Christ as brothers and sisters in the same family and their well-being. That is the strong enough reason to limit our choices and freedoms. I will act in a way to help them, love them, save them, rescue them and not cause them to stumble. And there is heat in what Paul is saying here, a realisation he has come to personally. If we think back to Acts 9, when Saul of Tarsus, the fanatical Jewish Pharisee, was travelling to Damascus on the way to persecute Christians, whom he considered back then a dangerous cult group, they must be wiped out. They are blaspheming. And then on the road to Damascus, a light blazed from heaven, causing him to fall to the ground, a voice speaking to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And upon his conversion, Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, would later realise that by persecuting Christians, he was persecuting the Lord Jesus himself. Christ is the head of the body, which is his church. You hurt my people, you hurt me, says Jesus. And Paul would use his fervent zeal to no longer hurt the people of God, but do whatever it takes to save, to rescue, to prevent harm for them. There is heat in what he says here, this conviction that has now channeled for the Lord Jesus. No wonder he's so strong on this. He never wants to see this mistake happen again when he was Saul of Tarsus. Deep shame that he had in hurting the people of God and he would never want to see that again. So for those who are strong or stronger, they must be careful of the effects of their behaviour on their weaker brethren. They carry the burden of responsibility. In a way, we can all understand this. In a minor way, it's a little bit like growing up in our families. Uh, most of us have grown up with siblings. Uh, some of us are the eldest, some of us are the youngest. And especially when kids are little, parents can put more responsibility on the older children the eldest one, to look out for the younger ones. Saying to the eldest boy, don't climb that bigger tree in the backyard whilst your little brother is around because you can do it, but he can't. If he's watching you, he'll try it. And we know he'll fall down. He'll hurt himself because he's not ready for it. And the natural compl complaint from the older one might be in this case, it's not fair. Why am I being held back because of him? And the answer is, because he's your brother. You're older. You know more. You have to look after him. You're responsible because that is what this family is about. That is what it means to be family. And how much more so in the family of God? Brothers and sisters matter. You take care of them. You're in a position and a privilege to do that, so you must. That comes out of who you are. It's not as if I'm going to do, go off and do what I want to do and they don't matter. No, you are a brother and sister and so are they and they matter. That's what the family of God is like. 
In our day and age, what might it look like to cause someone to stumble? So fourthly, modern knowledge with love. A more modern Australian example is the area of drinking alcohol, like we've mentioned before. Now we know that for adults, it is not wrong to drink alcohol, but the Bible warns against drunkenness, and for various reasons, some Christians don't drink or are uncomfortable to drink. Let's consider a story of two Christians. Let's call them Bob and Steve. They're both invited to a party by their unbelieving friend, and alcohol is flowing freely at this party. Everyone's got a glass of beer or wine in their hand. Uh, Bob is very comfortable drinking. He's keen to show that Christians are fun-loving people as a good witness to the unbelievers. Steve does not drink alcohol because he had alcoholic family members. And he worries because the last time that he drank, he drank too heavily, became drunk and passed out. And he now realises that he doesn't want to continue the bad family history. Now Steve is quite uncomfortable being at this party and he only agreed to come because Bob encouraged him to come. Oh, come on, let's, let's, you know, let's be Christians uh, amongst uh, the non-Christians here. And when their unbelieving friend, their host, starts to personally hand out to everybody glasses of champagne for a key toast, Bob happily takes some and Steve is balking and looking uncomfortable and Bob says, come on, Steve, have some champagne while having the toast. Well, here in this story, there are problems for Steve, aren't there? Steve becomes under pressure to drink in a peer pressure situation to go against his conscience, which will lead to unchristian behaviour of drunkenness. And Bob has contributed to this problem by adding to the peer pressure. What could Bob have done instead? Bob could have protected his Christian brother, Steve. He could have taken two non-alcoholic drinks where he and Steve could celebrate the toast with everyone else. He could have stood with Steve, so Steve is not the odd, odd, odd one out by not drinking the champagne. Everyone looking, at why aren't you taking the champagne? Why are you being rude? Are you, are you spoiling this occasion? No, 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 we, we want to participate, we'll just not drink alcohol in this case for the toast. So here is one area that we can be aware of, not only in how we conduct ourselves, but how we consider and help our Christian brothers or sisters, not putting them under pressure to do something they're uncomfortable with, not to go against their conscience. Because it's part of life in Australia, isn't it? You get invited to parties and weddings and dinners, drinks at the pub after work, absolutely should go. No problem with that, but being aware and loving in how we act. We let responsibility for others become more important than our individual freedoms. So as we sum up, we are to use our knowledge with love. We are humbled and thankful that we are known by God through Jesus and that that is how we've come to know him. And we grow in love for God and for each other because each one of us matters. We're brought into the eternal family of God by the death of Jesus. And our growing conscience, our self-awareness, allows us to see the opportunities and consequences of our choices on others. For us to grow stronger in right knowledge and right action. Grow in love and empathy for others, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We respect their differences because we are one family. They matter and we matter. And that is how we are to act. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you for the fact that we have been known by you. You are the one who reached out to us in Christ Jesus. You are the one who gave us this knowledge, transformed us by the Holy Spirit, that we might trust in Jesus and what he has done. And that has transformed us. We thank you for the love that we have for you in response to the love that you have had for us. And that is what makes real knowledge. Our awareness, our conscience, that is helped by the Spirit, helped by your word, to love other people in how we use our freedoms and our opportunities. We pray that indeed that you would allow us to be so careful, thoughtful and considerate, loving, caring, empathic, all of those things to understand our brothers and sisters, not judging them, but understanding them. 
and help us to act in such a way that we would show Christ and we would live out in a way that does not cause people to stumble, but rather displays Christ in his glory and a life transformed to live for him and not ourselves. And this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Thank you, music team. Uh, now we have a time of uh, socially distanced Q and A. Uh, we have a lot of questions today. Um, so I think uh, the passage has sparked a lot of interest, a lot of questions. First one being, uh, what if that which causes another to sin is seemingly trivial, unique to that person and hard to avoid, such as wearing a blue shirt or drinking coffee? Sure, I, I guess you have to work out um, what is it that you do if what you do causes someone to go against their conscience. Uh, it's more than just causing someone offence. It's actually uh, how have you acted in a way that's actually caused them to go against their conscience. Uh, so it might be to, if you're unaware, I mean, because you don't intentionally go out to actually cause someone difficulty, it might actually be that it has to get explained of what did you do or say which actually caused me a problem. And then, uh, then to weigh that up as in, okay, what is actually the problem or the issue? And then being prepared, I guess, for us to modify or change our behaviour if it causes a problem and if it's avoidable in that sense. Uh, so it probably depends on the scenario, uh, but it's remember the idea of causing someone to stumble is more than just offending them, which is an issue itself, but it's actually causing them to go against their conscience. So I guess think about uh, that scenario and then have it explained, have a discussion on what the problem is and what led to the problem to work out uh, what can be done about that or if there's any blame or fault or change that needs to happen in the future. On the flip side, does the weak Christian then have a responsibility to strengthen their conscience, especially if their hang-up is over something trivial or wrong? It's interesting that uh, in the New Testament, uh, it's, 1 Corinthians is not the only place where Paul addresses the strong and the weak. He does that in Romans, uh, Romans 14 and 15. It's interesting that Paul doesn't necessarily say to the weak, you know, pull your socks up, kind of, you know, what's wrong with you? Why are you persisting in this behaviour that we can see is, you know, you don't have to be in that position. You can be strong like us. He doesn't say that. Uh, he's actually one of understanding and respect and realising that, particularly in the area of food sacrifice to idols, if the person has this bad flashback or experience of going through what they were, which takes them back to becoming uh, a non-Christian and unbeliever, he's actually prepared to say, no, don't do that. Don't make them go that way. In a way, we can kind of infer that it's more for the position of the weak person to come when they're ready with God's help to come to a position where it doesn't bother them anymore. Uh, so for them to actually say, look, I would have liked you not to do that, but I'm, I'm now in the position where I'm comfortable with it. And when I can now eat food sacrifice to an idol and it doesn't cause me those flashback problems, I've gone from weak to strong. It's not, um, depending on what the issue is, it's not necessarily for the strong person or the person who doesn't have an issue to say to the weak person, you know, get your act together. It's not necessarily always that way, uh, but it kind of depends on what the issue is. And the loving or the caring thing could actually be giving people time and space and respect to then say, look, if you need to work that out, or you come to a position where you go, look, I don't think I can change from that, and in my self-awareness, it just has to be that way. So I mentioned alcohol. Uh, if you've met someone who is a reformed alcoholic, then you respect that, look, for the rest of their lives, if they've come to a position where they say, I can't drink alcohol, you can drink alcohol next to me, but I'm not going to do it because that will cause me to go on a bender, that will bring me back to the bad old days, I know I just can't do it. Then that's one of those things where you go, totally respect that, and if that doesn't change, that's not a problem because you've come to self-awareness in that. You, you've made a decision on what you need uh, and to keep on a really good track, and that's okay. That doesn't have to change. It's not like a reformed alcoholic has to then say, uh, 
oh, you know, I can just have one drink now, I'm okay with that. They don't have to do that because from what's happened, they've come to a place where they've worked it out of what they need and that's got to be respected. I'll, I'll merge the two, these two questions together. So what about things that don't cause people to sin but might be frowned upon due to tradition, either because of stigma or assumptions, such as uh, playing mahjong, cards, going to the internet cafe, uh, having a buffet at a casino. Um, and I suppose the second bit, well, what if it does cause people to sin, uh, but unknowingly so, such as wearing short skirts, bikinis on the beach, etc. Yes, so that, um, that issue of offence uh, is related to the whole issue of stumble, but not exactly the same thing. Uh, so if, because of tradition, if we have caused someone offence of some reason, then that's actually a good reason for us as Christians to reflect on that and think about that. And to actually think, look, I might not want to insist on my rights or freedom there, but I want to do something which will not cause unnecessary offence. So it's a similar sort of principle without being exactly the same thing. Um, so that's, that's kind of something to work out and that's some discussion. And it's not necessarily always a right and wrong issue, but on a spectrum, because when people come with tradition, it might be some people are highly traditional, some people are not traditional at all, or somewhere in between with that. So that's got to do with a few factors to uh, talk about and discuss depending on what it is. Um, so um, let's take the example of dress uh, between male and female. Uh, so there's men have to take responsibility for who they are and can't say, well, this because someone dressed like that, that caused me. No, you've got to take responsibility. Yet I'd also say to Christian women that what you do and what you dress does have an effect on people whilst they must take responsibility. So there's ways, of course, in which uh, Christian sisters can be aware that I will dress or conduct a way to not be uh, overly cause problems for my Christian brothers while still maintaining freedom that I can dress and look in a certain way as I choose. So again, that's a spectrum. Uh, and the thing is, is that mistakes that people make is saying it's all that person's fault. They caused me. No, no, no. Take some responsibility for yourself. Yet, each of us can also know we do have an effect on other people. You're mistaken if you think the way in which you speak, dress and act has no effect on other people. It does. It's just that matter of both groups or people considering all those all those things how was i affected by someone else yet how do i take my own responsibility for my choices and actions as well thanks pastor john i think that's all the time we have for questions mm -hmm. today thank you yep. so unfortunately we didn't have the time to get through all the questions um, so you still have about 12 hours to get your questions in and maybe get a response from Pastor John before he goes on annual leave. Um, I would also recommend or suggest that you take these questions with you to your growth groups uh, this week. Um, a lot of questions regarding how do we apply this passage in our lives and a lot of things to work through. Uh, I think your growth group leaders will be more than happy uh, to think through these things with you. Uh, that does bring our service to a close. Let me finish in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have knowledge and freedom in Christ. And we are sorry for the times when we have used these freedoms in a selfish and self-centered way. Uh, please help us to use our knowledge with love and for us to value our responsibility and love for others over our own rights and freedoms. Help us to continue to wrestle with and think through how it is that we can do this in our lives and be prayerful in the ways that we can serve and love others around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That brings our service to a close. Please do say, stay safe uh, and we look forward to joining uh, us again in service, hopefully in person if lockdown lifts, but otherwise online again. Have a good week.